senior island, and he is preparing himself to take a senior um, position in anesthesia and the intensive care. Um, in two seconds, we are going to be online on the MEGA YouTube. And now, actually, we are on the MEGA YouTube, and I will leave the webinar to Dr. Omar, who is my colleague, to introduce those top speakers from Puerto Rico, Dr. Glory and Dr. Ricardo. Thank you so much for being here tonight, and we are looking forward to listen to both of them. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Saad, for the nice introduction. Um, uh, again, hello, everybody, everywhere. Uh, my name is Omar, joining from Dublin, Ireland. Uh, it's my pleasure to join the webinar today, and uh, I'm very delighted to welcome two of our distinguished colleagues that are joining us uh, from the beautiful, fascinating Caribbean uh, island of Puerto Rico, Dr. Gloria Rodriguez Vega and Dr. Ricardo El Garcia. Uh, thanks for both of you for the time and effort. Um, the, we welcome both of you. Um, uh, Gloria and Ricardo will share us their uh, transatlantic experience in the, about the topic of the hour, which is COVID-19 in both adults and pediatrics. I would like also to express my warm uh, welcoming and thanking to all of our audience tonight or to today uh, attending the webinar. And please feel free if you have any question just write it down in the Q&A partition and we'll do our best to answer it. Um, well, because ladies first, uh, so uh, we'll go uh, with, with Glory um, introducing her and then she can share uh, her screen later on. So Dr. Rodriguez's uh, area of interest is internal medicine, intensive care and neurocritical care. Uh, Gloria was graduated from Cornell University and Central University of Caribbean, and she completed her internal medicine residency in the Veteran Affair uh, Caribbean Healthcare System. And she had later on the critical care fellowship in the Miriam Hospital at Brown, uh, at Brown University. She went back home again to Puerto Rico, spent many years in surgical intensive care and neurointensive care as well. She is currently the chief of the Department of Critical Care at HEMA, San Pablo uh, Cagos uh, Hospital. And she is also involved in many intensive care societies, has many publications and uh, co-editor of the book named Critical Care Administration, a comprehensive clinical guide. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I have a, a little question. If I'm visiting Puerto Rico, when would you uh, recommend me to go there. <laughs> that is an excellent question, Dr. Omar. And uh, you can come anytime you want. Um, right now, uh, it's a place where we have a high vaccination rate and a low COVID transmission. And I know COVID is the topic of the hour. So um, if you're vaccinated, come over and visit this Glorious Island. Now we have a um, tropical weather all year long. Thanks, Amelia. The floor is yours, and uh, you can share your screen. You already shared it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, thank you to the audience who are um, joining in us today, and uh, thank you to Dr. Saad uh, for allowing us to have this channel, the Mega, um, to be able to uh, communicate with the world and uh, our knowledge, and for him for organizing. Um, let me see, I'm trying to, here we go. So pandemics are not new to us. Um, this is the plague in Rome. This was um, to the Antonine plague. This was um, 165 AD. We know from this current era, the influenza pandemic. Um, this was a very uh, transmissive, 20% transmission vector, two and a half to 5% mortality. Um, there were a lot of deaths at the beginning. Um, the mortality was around the 20 and the 40s age. And um, so over the world, there were approximately 50 and 100 million deaths. So pandemics are not new to us. And now um, so we have our COVID vaccine is the one that we are living right now. And as of today, um, there had been over 259 million uh, confirmed cases and a little bit over 5 million deaths. So the question is, when will this end? If this will end? And uh, how do we get out of it? So 
what are the lessons that we have learned along the way in this pandemic? There are still some uh, to come. And uh, one thing we know is that some of the strategies that we used 100 years ago, um, and that is the good thing of documenting our experiences, um, such as uh, social distancing, hand washing, uh, confinement, we were talking before um, going live of the confinement and if we needed a newer one, a newer um, variants approach, it, do they work, do they not work? Um, and also we were talking about the use of masks. And these are things that have worked um, in every pandemic uh, and are the ones that we used at the beginning. Um, the other thing that we know is, and this um, we can uh, remind us of Einstein, right? If we do the same thing, we will get the same results. It's, it's uh, I think it's the definition of uh, lunacy, right? To expect different results when we apply the same thing. So that's another thing that we know. So at the beginning, what we learned was how do we prevent the transmission? And these were the three pillars. One of it was dissemination control um, and halting and doing the confinement. It did one of the things was controlling dissemination when you close the borders, when you had people to go into lockdown, but it also gave um, the government, the healthcare workers time to prepare because that's another thing that we're gonna be talking about later, um, the being prepared for a pandemic or for a response or for a disaster. There are some um, topics that are um, the same along the different types of disasters, but there are others that were um, new to this pandemic. The other thing is knowing the epidemiology and having good sense of, uh, of, of how this virus is behaving and how it's behaving with the population and getting numbers. And the other thing, um, social distancing. Um, we know for sure that all these type of agglomerations as they were happening, um, the one thing right um, from Italy, how it spread into um, Europe and into the Americas, um, Milano Fashion Week, there was a place where there was a high uh, agglomeration a lot of travel, and with this age and um, that we live, traveling is something that has been a challenge. And, and now with the Omicron variant, we know for sure um, that this virus is probably already spread and we just haven't identified it in our different countries. Um, so it's something that we need to at least try to control as we um, trying to avoid these newer uh, variants. Um, how do you do immigration controls? How do you do these epidemiological controls, not only worldwide, um, but also in your own countries, in your own towns and uh, taking control of that? Also, one of the things that we learned was um, the veracity of the information um, that we were getting. Who do you trust? Um, and what are the different um, associations that are going to be getting information and trusting World Health Organization um, has been in the forefront of this, right? Um, the other thing were the mass events. This was another one in uh, Valencia and in Atlanta um, that how do you access the control? How do you keep the distancing? And now in countries that have a high vaccination rate, these things are starting to open, but with certain controls. So at the beginning we were closing, now that we're opening um, these to these events, um, to these mass events, how do you control them? At least for um, example, um, in Puerto Rico, we're having mass events in which they require 100% vaccination um, to have X amount of seats. If, you have, if you're not going to require vaccination, but proof of negativity, um, then you only have half of the amount of seats. So that is something that these events um, are helping also in promoting vaccination. Um, stay at home, that was something that we spoke about, confinement and social distancing, but then until when are you going to have that confinement and uh, those lockdowns? We know now the impact of um, the psychological impact of these lockdowns, how it has been Will the elderly, with the children, um, the schooling at a distance, not only the psychological impact, but their academic impact. Um, the same thing is, is it economically feasible or possible to extend a lockdown and all these social distancing 
and we're not talking about standing six feet away, is that when you're planning an event um, or in your restaurants and the economy, having these um, barriers placed um, are something that impact economically your own um, area. So newer strategies on how to at least go down a little bit on these social distancing requirements as vaccination is uh, proving to be worthwhile, as masking is proving to be worthwhile, then there are certain things that we can start to uh, lower our requirements. Masking, I think, um, and we were talking about this um, in the preamble to this meeting, uh, masking, I think, has been essential um, to try to diminish the amount of transmission of your viral load when people are masked. But this requires a lot of teamwork. And this is something that we have learned um, throughout this pandemic. Um, with the help of the vaccine, and uh, there are several things that were required for the logistics of coming out with a vaccine um, so soon. One was a coalition for the epidemic preparedness innovations. Um, these are people that are pre Antifly planning for these things, NIH running large studies. There were the World Copper, there were more than 100 projects around the world. Um, the Human Challenge trial, where we had human as volunteers for these vaccines to come up, um, at least eight of them were tested in humans. But what were the possible obstacles that we learned um, with the development of this vaccine in such a, a short time? And one of them. Um, was how do you demonstrate your effectiveness? Um, how do you control the cost? How do you manufacture enough um, for to supply the world since this is a global pandemic? And how do you distribute it and guarantee its application in fairness? We know, uh, and we can have anecdotal um, stories on how these things were not done um, 100% uh, compliant. Um, the newer challenge is that several vaccines come up, which ones and which ones were um, purchased by different countries, how were they effective, but now with the newer variants, will the ones that were effective for the alpha, the beta, and the delta, are they going to keep being effective for the newer ones that are coming, newer studies keep coming up, um, and then that also goes back again on the possible obstacles as we approach newer variants. Um, the other thing is the requirement of booster vaccines and uh, how will that end up? Is this going to be something that is going to be required every six months? Is this going to be a yearly thing such as a flu vaccine? Um, as we don't know, right? Um, this will be seen after the pandemic starts um, finalizing and the newer variants start to stabilize and not as quickly. Um, I think the most uh, important thing and one of the bigger obstacles has been how has it been administered in, throughout the world. Um, we have countries that are already into their booster vaccines that are including their 5 to 11 year old population. But as you can see, there are countries such as Africa that are lagging behind and they haven't even um, started vaccinating the whole population. So as a world, until we control the the whole population and get that population vac uh, vaccinated, that is something that might be affecting um, the emergence of several strains and how do we get out of this pandemic? So this is something um, that we need to talk about. Um, what are possible solutions? Should we have a vaccine bank? Um, um, definitely international cooperation is a must, but who will be leading this international cooperation? Is it going to be um, the United Nations, the World Health Organization? Is it gonna be different governments getting together? Um, what are the uh, future of these and how do we get into um, vaccinating the whole world? Financial solutions, how do we, I mean, this is uh, something that is driven by pharmacy, um, and how do you come up with a financial solution for um, less uh, able countries to acquire these vaccines? Um, and also the epidemiological surveillance as we are seeing right now. I keep mentioning teamwork because it is essential on the uh, success of getting out of this pandemic and also resilience. Um, resilience from our healthcare workers and how do we treat 
our healthcare workers and the response. We've spoken earlier about the government response from a uh, public health policy standpoint, from a government standpoint, from a global standpoint. But now, what have we learned about our emergency response protocols within our institutions? Um, and one of the things is um, that you can never be too prepared, right? Being prepared is something that has been demonstrated um, to help with um, our response to a pandemic or to a disaster, but newer things have come up um, with this new pandemic, uh, with COVID, and it's the concept of distributive justice. What scores are we gonna be using when we assign who gets treatment or not? We saw at the beginning how Italy uh, had their response and how they had to um, at times pick an age um, and say these people are not going to be treated. Um, is that fair? Is that uh, distributed justice? Are we gonna be using other scoring systems beside age, um, productivity? Is it gonna be um, the MSOFA? Is it gonna be other type of scoring system on, on a way for this to be just, um, and who will make that decision? Will it be the frontline healthcare worker that is already having the burden of, of providing care so these are things that we're gonna be talking about a little bit. So as we know, when you have a disaster, you're, you're a command center. And uh, I urge every time there's a, a, uh, an event coming up or a seasonality here in Puerto Rico, we have our hurricane season. So before hurricane season, we do a little review um, of these things, our command center, our communications, how they're gonna be. Um, one of the things we've learned um, especially after the Hurricane Maria, was that we needed to integrate an ethics committee within our structure. Um, these weren't decisions that we were going to leave to our first line, frontline workers. Um, how do you escalate um, the type of, uh, of response that you need? And when do you ask for um, outside help? Um, also, the things about equipments, we've talked uh, about ventilators, um, the need for oxygen, um, the need for sedation and analgesia, how it came about within this pandemic as we were treating them, how are experimental drugs going to be used, where they're going to be used outside um, research uh, protocols or where they're going to be used within, um, and which drugs, uh, because the whole world was using them, so there was a shortage, so how do we repurpose other drugs? for these things. So one of the things is these we learned, so we should be incorporating these um, lessons and what we learned in our hospitals um, and in our response into our future protocols. Um, there were other elements um, that are also uh, to be included. And this was um, one of the example was New York. New York already had um, a limitation for heroic treatments such as ECMO. They even had um, limitations when ventilators were not available, um, when oxygen was not available, and how we're going to quantify that and to distribute it. And as I mentioned earlier, including an ethics committee into this planning um, to be on hand when these tough decisions were needed to be made and not to leave them for our frontline healthcare workers. Um, SCCM also um, re imagine their tier staffing strategy. And uh, one of the things is as advanced practice providers have become um, commonplace in our ICUs, um, how do you also um, increase your demand um, with these models? And these were very helpful. And these were not made right into the pandemic. These had been developed beforehand um, in these scenarios and that's part of the preparedness. Um, and you should get them um, and have them introduced in your, um, in your protocols. One of the things we learned is the mortality rate of COVID was not only um, elevated due to the disease itself, but there was also a correlation on the amount of healthcare providers that were present or available. Um, and that's something very important. The same thing, um, happened in New York, it depend when you had your higher admissions, the higher was your rate and also depending on your age rate. So how do you do grow an ICU 
when you don't have enough space. Um, and that is something that this pandemic had um, made us uh, reimagine the amount of, of space that we needed, um, the containment um, because of the isolation that you needed, the amount of supplies. How do you adequately grow that ICU in terms of your visiting hours, of the levels of personal protection? And one good example of innovation was Hospital El Salvador in El Salvador. Um, they, what they did was, this was um, a former Olympic complex and they turned it into a hospital with, an, with a huge amount of ICU beds and a control panel with intensivists. So what they did was, this was um, in situ telemedicine with the intensivists here providing care and then non ICU physicians or healthcare workers were trained um, and uh, we were part of this training into managing these patients at the bedside. But then you had this limited amount of intensivists in doing telemedicine and that way um, we uh, protected the knowledge on taking care of these patients by not exposing these limited amount of intensivists that were in El Salvador. So that was a very ingenious way of coming up. But this required not only um, collaboration and teamwork from the uh, critical care societies and medical societies, but also with the government. Um, that's one of the things. And the other thing was addressing vulnerabilities. Um, after you do have a, an event, a disaster, um, you usually have an after meeting. Um, the problem or the lesson learned with COVID is we're still in COVID. So we're still having these after um, meetings during um, as we uh, are overgoing this pandemic. So right now we're talking about the newer variants and uh, how are we going to address this? So you're constantly preparing while you are also taking care of these patients. So that's one of the things um, with burnout that uh, we need to address. One of the things is preventing the consequences of what we come up with, um, especially treat treating a disease for which we don't have treatment. Um, there were seven, you know, you looked at the pathophysiology, you applied certain concepts, certain things were tried, um, but there were several problems along the way. Number one, um, the development of, of a drug requires research, investment, and a development. It requires an international cooperation, and also there are certain regulations within different countries that allows you to either research on a certain drug or not. So these are one of the challenges that we have faced, but also with the treatment was the media coverage that we got. And at the beginning, I mentioned um, who do, one of the important things is who do you trust with your information? Um, and uh, there was a lot, and there is still a lot of misinformation um, that you know the Harvard Gazette has called the pandemic of misinformation with um, the benefits of social media of allowing to be able to communicate faster than in the written form or having a paper being submitted to a journal, accepted and then published. Um, but there was a lot of misinformation um, in there, out there in the media um, that you had to take over. One of the first things um, that suffered these consequences was the use of hydroxychloroquine. At first, um, it was considered something that would be efficacious. And now there are a lot of papers that uh, question the validity and the use of this drug. And now it's not even in the guidelines. Um, the amount of research that came out is something positive, um, which says that a lot of the things you can do them quicker, getting them prepared, but still um, there has to be an oversight and some rigorous, as we have seen with what happened in ivermectin, that now we are having um, recalls of this um, retractions from different journals the, the, that things have been published and they have gone through an editorial board, but now we're coming into retraction. So even within, we've, we've uh, spoken about how media had helped with this misinformation, but also the medical community, we have to be very cognizant um, and stay within uh, the realms of good and proper researching. So 
is there a light at the end of the road as we finished um, this lecture? Um, yes, there is. We have the COVID vaccine. And um, it's not that I'm a foresighter, it's that we can learn and we have learned from the past. Um, you know, there have been pandemics, we have come out of them. Uh, there have been, with the introduction of vaccines and also without the introduction of vaccines, there has been pandemics that have been controlled, but mostly thanks to the use of vaccines. From now, one example, it can be um, polio, it can be um, rubella, it can be influenza. We have come out, right? Um, but others such as um, bubonic plague, uh, a vaccine didn't come out, but we learned about the disease and then we established um, strategies on how to get rid of that, of the vector and control the vector. So yes, um, is there an end of the end of the road of the tunnel? Is there light at the end of the tunnel? Yes, there is. We have the COVID vaccine. Um, we've had monoclonal antibodies and uh, learning from previous uh, viral diseases and from other diseases and, and from sepsis, we've learned this time is of the essence. So the sooner you start to implement um, your targeted therapy, the better the outcome will most likely be. So the same thing with monoclonal antibodies, these are given as an outpatient. So early detection and diagnosis is still of the essence. Like I mentioned, um, for part of the Euro epidemiology. Um, and now we have two newer drugs that are hopefully, um, if they're given early within five days, most like um, the same thing with Tamiflu and influenza. This one is from Merck, Molnupiravir, and uh, Pfizer, Paxlovid also came out. Um, they're still asking, in, at least in the United States, for FDA EUA approval, but they're still we're still now having um, a drug that is targeted to the disease. So I hope that at least a uh, half hour that we've spoken, um, you've learned some lessons that, uh, and I've been able to share some lessons that we learned from this pandemic that we are still learning because it's still not over. But as we prepare, what will the next pandemic be? Is it gonna be viral? Is it gonna be something else? How will it be? How will it behave? Um, and this is where you need your think tanks. Um, there are global organizations that are asking these same questions. Um, how will it be planning different scenarios so, you, so that they can be prepared and, and help other um, countries and governments to be prepared for this pandemic? When will it be? Um, we usually talk about every 100 years, but as we can see, um, there are several um, events that have happened throughout the world that don't take 100 years. So I don't, I don't know if this will take another 100 years for another global pandemic. Um, probably it'll be earlier and we'll be seeing it. So where will it start? Where will it be? These are the questions that we need to ask ourselves. Um, applying the lessons we have learned um, and uh, being better prepared for the future. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And uh, thank you, Mega, for allowing me to be part of this. Thanks, Gloria, for your nice presentation. And uh, it's very comprehensive. And, uh, and it was actually inspiring also the, uh, the experience of uh, El Salvador to control um, uh, the, the intensive care unit uh, through telemetry. Uh, we would think about this, I think, everywhere now in our countries, and um, uh, it gives also some uh, backup plan in case if there is again any pandemic and you don't have enough stuff. Uh, I have one question for you uh, from Mohammed Suleiman. He's asking, what do you expect from the new variant of COVID? Uh, we've spoke about that, right? And uh, so what do I expect? We need to learn more. We know that this variant um, has several mutations in their spike protein. Um, so it's a little bit more aggressive. We know it, it's highly contagious. Um, the one thing that we don't know yet is how does it respond to the vaccine? So is, you know, are the current vaccines that we have that we hopefully all of us have received, um, Will it protect us? Um, and remember, the vaccines, um, even if they don't prevent you from getting it, it does the numbers. What they um, say is that they prevent you from the severe disease, from hospitalization and death. 
So from a global perspective, that's still a good thing. And that's how we should focus on this. Um, you know, similar to influenza, influenza is still there, but with proper vaccination, then your case, you know, your cases go down. And if you get the disease with the medications, you prevent these hospitalizations and deaths. So I think that should be um, one of the things. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, if we don't vaccinate um, and do an um, equal distribution of vaccination throughout the world, we're going to be seeing other mutations. And uh, from what we've seen, you know, there will be a one that's more contagious than uh, Delta. Uh, we don't know if Omicron, um, but there will be another one. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's another question. Uh, can a patient be infected with two variants of COVID at the same time? Have you, ever, have you ever been through this in your experience? I have not, um, but it would be, you know, thinking if uh, while you are infected with one, you're having a, an immune response. So usually that should prevent you from getting um, uh, infected with another, you know, with COVID again. Um, and uh, usually if you're infected, they tell you even to wait a little bit to benefit from that immunity that you get, that natural immunity you get from your infection. Um, to be infected with two variants at the same time, that would require that uh, the variant that infects you the second time around has evaded your immune response. Hmm. So I guess theoretic theoretically it could be possible, but I have not heard of a case. Um, remember that for this also, you need to do sequencing and not all the countries have that capability. This usually is done on research purposes. I don't know, have you been uh, uh, to lockdowns in Puerto Rico during the first wave or not? Um, uh, I, I think there is some of the uh, European countries here have been through lockdown and others they preferred just to continue open and uh, the data coming uh, is just no big difference, to be honest, between the, the countries who locked down and the countries who didn't lock down in the numbers. And uh, here in Ireland, uh, with the full human activity nowadays, we still see the numbers are, I mean, infections and the critically ill patients are still reasonable. Uh, and when you compare it, I mean, to the human activities happening now and everything is open. So I don't know uh, how the situation in Puerto Rico now if any plan for lockdown or have you been through lockdowns, is there any difference? What's your experience in this? Well, in, in Puerto Rico, um, the government stopped doing lockdowns uh, unless the, you know, the, there's a good collaboration with the, within the Department of Health and, uh, and also the, the economic, there was a medical task force at the beginning that gave their suggestions and there was an economic task force because you don't want mm -hmm. to also um, be in lockdown so much that you halt the economy and then then you go into another um, problem with, with the country. Um, so as the people have become more vaccinated, they have been analyzing which areas are of higher transmission. So obviously where you take your mask off, the restaurants, the nightlife. So what they're doing is they are restricting the hour. So there is um, from, I think it's from 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. till five in the morning, then you can't go out to the bars or something like that. And uh, but now they're, but they're, you know, and they look at the numbers and if the numbers go down, they open up a little bit more and they see how the, and I think the country and the population has learned um, along the way that when everybody cooperates, then you get more liberties and then you don't get lockdown. So I think those, those are one of the things. That's great. Uh, I think, uh, well, I have a question here, but I think you answered already how to balance the economy with restrictions requirements. Yeah, it's just a, a sort of selection of the counties that have higher rates and try to limit the hours, as you mentioned, and then uh, reviewing the data coming and the updates and then deciding accordingly. Thank you very yeah. much, Gloria. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening and uh, for your very good questions. Thanks, Emilian. At this point, uh, we will move to Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo is a very gentleman. Uh, he is uh, a director of pediatric intensive care unit in Puerto Rico. Uh, in University Pediatric Hospital in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, he is also the director of the Pediatric Critical Care Fellowship at the University of Puerto Rico School of Medicine. Uh, 
uh, he's speaking to us uh, tonight or today, according to your time, uh, about the pediatrics um, and the COVID. So welcome, Ricardo, and thank you very much for your time and effort. And please, for the audience, if you have any question, uh, please just type it down in the Q&A uh, part and we'll do uh, our best to answer it. Thank you very much. The floor is yours now. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, to Gloria for her wonderful lecture. Uh, we will talk about a little bit of uh, different people now, the children, and we will talk about uh, how this uh, pandemic has uh, affected children, how is that in the biology, define the disease severity in pediatrics, um, same uh, and risk factors for children, what are we doing for the management of these kids? Uh, define the other disease process that we have seen in pediatrics, the multisystemic inflammatory syndrome or MISC and PIMS is another term used by the World Health Organization, the risk factors, what are the current management, the outcomes and touch a little bit on uh, what already uh, Gloria talked about prevention strategies. So in children, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, the Transmission was a concern among children and that uh, driven or drove the lockdowns and uh, the closing of schools. Since children historically uh, transmit viruses uh, to other people, uh, mainly from studies on influenza. And that's one of the reasons that the children get immunized for influenza, not so much because they get so sick from the disease process, even though they can get sick, because they used to transmit the virus, they were considered super spreaders. But as the pandemic evolved, and we have seen on time, the percent of cases in the US and the, in the world uh, of patients with COVID-19 uh, remain uh, relatively low, less than 7% in some uh, areas, or 1% when you look at the overall hospitalization rate, depending on the series. And the COVID-19 death related to children has also remained uh, relatively low. There was a publication in England uh, where they uh, estimated that one in every 50,000 children will get to the ICU and almost two in a million will have an absolute risk for death. So when you look at uh, the hospitalization rate and this data from the CDC up to uh, November 27th of this uh, year, the cumulative uh, hospitalization rate, the red bar in uh, is uh, the total number of accumulative uh, rate of hospitalization over uh, 100,000 people. And the little black dots is the percent of those hospitalizations to be long to pediatric population. So I'm getting hospitalized as frequent as adults I, a lot and um, the rate has remained low even though with the variance. So what is disease severity? In children, uh, this, there are several studies that we will talk about briefly uh, that define it as children who get admission to the ICU needs uh, non-invasive or invasive ventilation or die from COVID. From this uh, pragmatic definition, our patients uh, that we treat are just as the adults that are using the World Health Organization um, definition, patients with hypoxemia, moderate ARDS, signs of respiratory distress, uh, radiologic evidence of pneumonia, uh, support, mechanical ventilation, and um, in addition to um, uh, uh, septic shock, multi-organ failure, and increased uh, inflammatory markers. So let's quickly review what we already, mostly of us know about coronaviruses, but try to give a insight or why children are uh, responding differently. And we know that we get exposed to a virus or a bacteria and we have two components of our immune system, the innate immune response and the adaptive immune response. Once we get exposed to the uh, innate, uh, to the virus or the, uh, oh, sorry for the sun that is in my face. Um, uh, so we get the response from the, uh, our immune system, the neutrophils, monocyte, macrophages, and dendritic cells uh, produce uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and uh, those uh, promote uh, the identification of the virus and the neutralization. And at the same time, or a little bit later, 
our adaptive immune response with T cells and B cells produce antibodies, plasma cells that get uh, rid of the virus. And this is, was a review uh, published by Medicine and Pharmacology on innate and adaptive immune responses against coronavirus uh, from uh, last year, 2020. Uh, and we knew from our uh, previous uh, experience with uh, immune response to SARS-CoV-2 that we, we get exposed to maybe a lower titer, uh, virus titer, like um, the masking has helped also to decrease the spreading, uh, I think more than the, even the, the lockdowns. Uh, you get your in, uh, activation on your innate re immune response, you may get hospitalized or not, and you want a normal immune response and recover. Some patients, and depend depending on the high virus titer, may get a more severe activation of this immune response, which at the same time, these uh, pro-inflammatory markers promote uh, tissue and cellular damage, get the patient on ICU, multi-organ failure, and increase the risk of death. Uh, but uh, we are not seeing that same uh, immune response in pediatrics. So what is the difference or what are the theories? Well, there is this uh, publication uh, from uh, the, uh, the Journal of, of Science uh, and Nature uh, that uh, talks about the reduced development of COVID-19 in children, reveals molecular checkpoints, gating pathogenesis, eliminating potential therapies. And basically to your left in the cartoon, you have the adults, you have the children, in pediatrics, the pediatric population gets common calls by coronaviruses or other coronaviruses. So one of the theories is that uh, the epithelium is uh, more primed to respond to the viral infections because of their ex previous exposure. They have less um, AC2 receptors on the epithelium. Also, we know that the spike protein, in addition to getting to the AC2 receptor, it gets uh, anchor to the TMP RSS2 uh, 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 receptor 2, and those are less common also in the alveolar cells of the uh, pulmonary uh, epithelium. Uh, the immune response of the children to the production of, of interleukin 6, that has been also uh, a marker of increased inflammation in adults, is not as robust in pediatrics. So also it is thought that that um, immune response is more um, appropriate for the exposure to the virus. And also there was a theories or concepts that patients that were vaccinated recently or has been exposed to vaccinations, the innate process is more um, uh, robust as we get older or the children get older, our, uh, adaptive re response gets more robust. So it, was, it is what protects us at the long term, but in the short term, uh, the innate response is the one who help us to uh, cope with the virus. When you get to uh, this other uh, paper from Science Translational Medicine, they study the immune response of SARS-CoV-2 infection in hospitalized pediatric and adult patients. And basically they found that the, pa the pediatric patients had longer, uh, shorter lengths of stay they were less uh, need for mechanical ventilation with a lower mortality. And they, basically the main difference was not so much the interleukin levels, if not the antibody production or the adaptive response was lower in the pediatric population, uh, arguing or going in favor that the immune response is, uh, is not over uh, exaggerated um, uh, from the uh, natural immunity. Also that the naive T cells that the patients have or children have, uh, have more uh, ability to mount a uh, new uh, response than the ones that are already trained for other disease process from being uh, in the adaptive immune response. So that gets us then what all the risk factors because we see uh, COVID-19 uh, in the ICU, but obviously with a less frequency. And these two papers, one uh, from Italy, they review all the cases that they had uh, in the beginning of the pandemic. It was published on pediatrics of um, October of last year. And then uh, this other paper uh, on pediatrics also, but this time uh, published on uh, 
this year on November, uh, it found that patients who are younger than one age get higher risk for get hospitalized, but they were not an increased risk of death. Patients with pulmonary problems, diabetes, the I place there that the US experience is higher, the incidence of type one diabetes in, as a risk factor for getting hospitalized compared to other countries is not uh, found that same uh, reason. Sickle cell disease, congenital heart disease, immunosuppression, but mainly the last three things, genetic disorders, neurologic disorders, metabolic condition, medically complex patients, and obesity has been the most common reasons for ICU admission and the higher mortality in that group population. It was thought that the high number of patients that were getting hospitalized less than a year old in the hospital was more related to we as a pediatrician, we see a child or an infant that is sick and we don't know what the, Ill, uh, the course of the illness was going to be. They got hospitalized, not because they were too sick, if not more concerned of what going, was going to happen. And that has uh, remained like that, even um, with the incidence of in the pregnant uh, females that developed COVID, uh, it has been shown that neonatal transmission of the COVID uh, is very low with low risk for the baby, more risk for the uh, uh, pregnant woman if and if she's not vaccinated because they uh, uh, end on with uh, prematurity and not because the baby gets uh, COVID-19 infection, more the risk associated with the complications on the baby are for uh, premature labor. So what do we do for management? We use what you use in uh, for adults, we don't, there's not much data on pediatrics, even uh, almost two years later of the pandemic. We know it requires a multidisciplinary approach. We still get preparation of the ICU, uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, staff, personal protection equipment, isolation rooms, and um, the respiratory support and the management has evolved over the last few years. We know now that we don't delay uh, the support based on risk for transmission as, as the personal. We will provide oxygen, high flow nasal cannula, non-invasive ventilation, and even conventional mechanical ventilation. As Gloria mentioned, ECMO is limited to high uh, resource centers with a uh, mixed experience in pediatrics from 80% survival rate if they end on ECMO to only 20% survival on uh, ECMO. So it will depend on your resources. But again, uh, overall, the mortality is low and the support system remains the same and the management. Remembering that high flow nasal cannula uh, is still the first line of therapy. We use uh, the isolation room and we place a mask over the high flow needs of Canada to limit the spreading or the station particles. And we treat right to give uh, adequate oxygenation and um, a relief of the respiratory distress in the patient uh, from the standpoint of respiratory support. If the patient gets uh, sicker, uh, the uh, evidence have shown us that we should not delay intubation, that we can do early pronation, even in patients who are not intubated, we can promote a um, change in the position. I guess it's in pediatrics, it's easier to prone a one-year-old or two-year-old versus uh, uh, 80 kilo adults, but uh, is, uh, it's not uh, difficult or taxing for the personal, but again, a lot of protection of the, uh, or, or the problems relate to the protection of the personal or having enough PPE. Uh, remember to use high PEEP, low channel volume ventilation, limit your bottle pressure, driving your pressure less than uh, 15 or 18 if possible, and follow the ARDS guidelines. So all this uh, involves optimization of the respiratory uh, system, um, following respiratory mechanics and uh, all this that we heard before about uh, L and H uh, compliance, it all depends and it will evolves uh, between the two. Uh, we use uh, nitric oxide. We don't have access necessarily to uh, ECMO. So we, uh, if patient is not improving, it's still high, very hypoxemic, we will give it a try. Um, remember uh, to keep it well uh, uh, nutrition. Hemodynamic and, uh, optimization is essential to keep, uh, uh, prevent 
secondary organ damage and multisystemic organ dysfunction. Like we say, a dry lung is a happy lung, so fluid balance is uh, essential to the management. Uh, patient safety, central access to avoid uh, losing IV access or sedation, um, uh, uh, personal protection equipment for your healthcare worker, and follow strict guidelines. Usually, uh, the Pediatric patients that remains in the ICU, the length of stay remains less than seven to 10 days, even with COVID, more uh, uh, being sicker. Uh, usually may remain in the ICU longer just because of the isolation room and avoid moving the patient around the hospital. So uh, the therapies are the same as a year ago, or a year ago, no, six months ago when we talked, we don't have uh, much difference in pediatrics yet. Uh, we're still using Redemsevere for patients, uh, depending on the age and the weight, uh, because there have been uh, studies uh, say, uh, talking about the safety. Uh, we are uh, relying on the results from models to uh, talk about the effectiveness. We use dexamethasone up to the dose that adults use of six milligrams per, uh, uh, per day. And in the case that they cannot receive uh, one of those, uh, we also may use varicinitib as an alternative for immunosuppression and even in severe critical care patients. We do not use convalescent plasma as an alternative therapy. There is not enough data to prove that it helps the pediatric population, even in the adult population, is not uh, well uh, robust the data that it will help the patient by the time we are uh, so much on severe disease in this uh, particular population. So uh, there was limited data, like I say, on the use of severe. the authorization was given us uh, with, uh, with emergency, but the studies uh, published on pediatrics on May of this year uh, shown that it has low threshold for uh, adverse events or toxicity. Uh, the study did not, um, was not powered to show difference in uh, mortality or decrease on mechanical ventilator days. But it is, uh, anyhow, in the study population, the mortality rate was relatively low, uh, where only four deaths from the patient population that was studying this uh, paper. So other therapies that does not uh, has zero data to be used in pediatrics. Uh, some of them already was mentioned by Gloria also. We talk about hydroxychlorine, imbermectin, uh, famotidine, all those. Uh, there's no data to prove that they decrease the length of stay or decrease the severity of illness in pediatrics, and even less uh, to prevent the con uh, contagious of, or progression of the disease in less severe uh, patients. So what we see, what happened with children, so the, this is a slide that showed before May that was up to uh, January, showing that the mortality rate was less than 0.1% in the pediatric population defined as less than 18 years of age compared with the other age groups that are seen there. And when you see uh, that data from the conglomerate data from the CDC up to November 27th of this year, uh, the, uh, in, I know it's not well seen, but um, in your far right, it says age group. The four bars that represent pediatrics are these four that are here. And it, it, they never go up, uh, even though when there are spikes in mortality, when there were uh, clusters or increase in the incidence of cases in the adult population, in pediatrics, it remained low. Um, we did not see, uh, even with, uh, that we saw more positive patients with Delta variant, but we did not see an increase in the hospitalization rate uh, on the ICU or mortality associated with the variant. We saw that there were more positive cases, but not necessarily using the healthcare resources. And the graph on the right is uh, talking about the same, that mortality overall as a group is less than 0.1%. So before talking to prevention strategies, the other disease process that we see in pediatrics is called multisystemic inflammatory syndrome. And basically it was defined by the CDC and the World Health Organization as a disease process that affected primarily children less than 20 years of age 
had fever for more than 24 hours in the World Health Organization, it says three days, had uh, uh, markers of inflammation like CRP, sedimentation rate, procalcitonin, ferritin levels, LDH, IL-6, uh, neutrophils, and they also have uh, evidence of clinical uh, uh, organ dysfunction that requires hospitalization. Among the organs that may be involved, there were cardiovascular, respiratory, renal, GI, neurologic, dermatologic, and or, and, or look like Kawasaki disease. For those of you who are not pediatricians, Kawasaki disease is a kind of an autoimmune disease process that is seen in children from three to uh, uh, eight years of age that usually presents with high fever it is known because of uh, cardiovascular dysfunction and the development of coronary artery uh, aneurysms, which can cause infarcts and make the patients die. So these patients uh, started presenting on, on England and New York, and they were noticed to be like Kawasaki, but when they did testing for COVID, they found that they had prior infection, uh, even uh, a positive test by PCR, serology, or antigen testing within four weeks. It is now thought that up to six weeks also, uh, you can have the infectious process. Interestingly, these patients, when they had the test positive and they were uh, classified as missed, some of them has had respiratory symptoms, but the respiratory symptoms belong to the cardiovascular dysfunction. They were in high favor. They may have pulmonary edema, more than having trachea of ARDS as a part of the presentation. So um, and, uh, this slide on your left, uh, by March of last year, there were 3,185 cases on the registry from the CDC. Up to November 1st, it went up to 5,526. The, the age group that uh, gets more commonly uh, in, uh, the disease process are usually between nine up to 10 years old, uh, up to 13 years old. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, the mortality is less than 0.1% too, but we have seen that there was a more a prevalent uh, occurrence uh, among Hispanic, Latinos, and Black African-Americans, uh, but still not uh, related to the genetic predisposition. I think that the patients are getting sicker because they have uh, inequality on the access, especially in the US. And 60% um, of the patients were married. Risk factors, uh, I'm sorry, the management of this patient population became standardized, uh, more or less. Patient with, who gets with shock to the hospital in pediatrics and met the criteria for MISC will get admitted to the pediatric ICU. Uh, supportive ICU care, universal precautions. At the beginning, we were putting all these patients in isolation because we didn't know if they, they were infected from the stamina of COVID. We have learned that they are not because usually it's past infection, not active infection. And the goal directed management was to uh, reverse the shock status and uh, start uh, immunoglobulins uh, G intravenously at two grams per kilo, total dose of max gram of 120. Uh, since this can be a volume, uh, a little bit of a volume challenge for the patient, uh, depending on the cardiovascular status, it will be given over 24 hours over, or over 48 hours. They will also get uh, metoprednisolone, two milligrams per kilo day, and they will get aspirin as prophylaxis up to uh, 81 milligrams daily, and they will get low molecular weight uh, heparin prophylaxis based on individual patient risk factors. Those usually will be adolescents. Uh, interestingly, in a uh, difference from adult population, pediatric population thromboembolic events is extremely rare, even in COVID. So the use of low molecular weight um, is very uh, specific, not standardized for the use on this patient population. So what the literature says that happened with this, there was a study in Colombia called MISCO study that was published in BMC Pediatrics from uh, this year. And basically they review all the patients that were admitted to the different ICUs in the, uh, Colombia. And they found that they had a similar uh, presentation. The most common sign of presentation was cardiovascular instability and shock. The other most common uh, symptom other than the cardiovascular system 
uh, was uh, GI symptoms. And uh, they had a little bit higher mortality rate as compared with uh, other published uh, series. And they uh, pro uh, postulate that maybe the reason uh, for the increased mortality was access for the medical care because not all the patients where they got hospitalized, they had got all the resources to manage a patient with uh, shock or need for uh, hemodynamic support. There was also a review from the International Journal of uh, Emergency Medicine that also they look at the therapies and what have been shown. And again, uh, it has been shown that immunoglobulins and corticosteroids either or uh, make uh, promote a recovery of the patient uh, and the patient uh, and, and good outcomes. The, there was a publication in JAMA looking at the combination of the therapies like we do, that is immunoglobulins plus methylprednisolone versus immunoglobulins alone. The main difference on this uh, publication that they found was that the patient became, became a febrile and faster if you combine the therapies. And that has been our experience with the patient that we have had, that we got uh, usually 24 to 40 hours, the patient's uh, is a febrile and the hemodynamic instability also resolves with a good outcome. The patient usually recovers and, and uh, the extent of the disease, if they will develop uh, aneurysms in the future is still to be seen because again, uh, there's not so much follow-up yet or has not passed enough time to see what that will, will take if any uh, change in the patient to the future. So the outcomes of this disease process, the incidence is slow, usually follows the peak on adult cases, not including cases in pediatrics. Again, asymptomatic pediatric patients mostly. Uh, even if the adult gets sick, they may or may not get COVID or, or notice that their child got COVID. And we see after the peak waves of the adults or the surge in the adult cases, then we see uh, four to six weeks later that we get a patient on there for the emergency room or in the ICU that has uh, missed criteria. The mortality remains low and the higher risk identified is access to adequate support system for the pediatric population for that child. When we look at, again at the mortality of COVID and MISC still less than 0.1% uh, overall. So, uh, what about then pediatrics and all this uh, deal with uh, uh, in, in the management? So uh, in pediatrics, we have had a lot of changes secondary to the pandemic. Uh, we know that the family is vital for the recovery. We know that effective communication as uh, vaccines began to roll out uh, was important. We, we as pediatricians are promote vaccination or we get all our vaccination usually when you're a child. So because we know that vaccines work, um, but the impact of not having enough uh, people to be cared, uh, the limitation of visiting hours, all that uh, took a toll on the emotional support that the child gets while he is on the hospital and uh, changed at some point. Uh, what we usually do is that we always provide uh, company from the parents, or one of the parents while his child is in the ICU. And uh, we took care that no, no child, in spite of the disease process that is going on, being COVID or non-COVID, uh, never should die alone. So, Kasid uh, Manan, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it well, but uh, in an editorial from the intensive care unit, intensive care medicine of this year, of June, and he summarizes very well with this cartoon of the coronavirus, how the pandemic affected our pediatric population. Well, it provoked a lot of uh, uh, cancellation on semi-elective surgeries that got delayed, that the families cannot visit their loved ones in the hospital or the ICU. We have seen the worsening of the inequality. Uh, the children got affected because they cannot go to schools. and. Uh, uh, the adults, we kept going out, but the children has to remain home. Again, uh, at least was an initial impression from what we knew for that they can do with uh, influenza. But as the data roll out, also the media didn't help. Like Gloria was saying, 
we got mixed messages and the people got a little bit hesitant of what to do with them. Uh, mental health got affected on children. Uh, we saw an increase of uh, suicide attempts getting admitted to the ICU from being in the lockdown. We know now that social media is not so social. You need to socialize to be uh, more effective in your uh, uh, development skills. Uh, in some places, because the ICUs were um, uh, emptier, we saw a lot of patients going to adult, uh, a lot of our ICU staff going to adult, uh, we give support to adult ICUs. That also took a toll on the staff. Um, we had children who get delayed presentation to the hospital, so they presented them with a different spectrum of signs and symptoms. And we saw also an increase in uh, patients with uh, non-accidental trauma or battered child, um, mostly secondary to the isolation of the parents leading with them, uh, working with them. So caring for these children requires still a multidisciplinary team, like Gloria was saying. This is not only physicians and nurses and equipment. You need the housekeeping. You need the one that brings the food. You need the one who takes uh, the samples to the lab. You need the laboratory technician. So we have to take care of all those people that they do not get a burnout because of the disease process or the pandemic has uh, caused on us. And uh, uh, finalized uh, prevention strategies. I just mentioned that children do not get as sick, that children do not get as um, uh, the mortality rate is relatively low. And we have a dairy stand that proves that children that get sick from COVID are not the one who spread us on, uh, or, or school spreaders in school. There are several studies that show that mostly patients uh, who get sick on school that, that were, have COVID uh, positive, they got it from an adult, especially in younger children. We are I'm saying younger children is less than 10, 12 years old like an adolescent is uh, more like an adult in, in terms of spreading the disease. So why vaccinate them? Well, because we were talking about earlier, if we don't get everybody immunized, we will keep the virus prevalent in the community and the virus can keep mutating. So it will uh, uh, prevent uh, further uh, control of the pandemic. Uh, there is a high uh, movement from UNICEF and the World Health Organization on Leading minds online uh, that gets a multidisciplinary approach on the children and how we cope with the disease, starting with the protection to avoid further uh, damage to the psyche of the children and uh, physical abuse that they have been submitted, the delay on their education, uh, as something maybe as simple that we can think that, oh, they get home and stay online and study online. No, they do not, do not have access. Uh, equal access to online education or, or just to uh, uh, keep going to, to the provider of internet. Uh, social protection, but, uh, they, get, uh, they can use the mask. They behave better than we do as adults. If they, you teach them why they have to have the mask, they will keep their mask on. We have seen from uh, the several studies that the masking on children on on pediatrics have decreased the prevalence of other viruses like RSV, influenza, but are concerned that uh, not getting immunized like measles, we could, have, we, could, we could have a then an epidemic of measles in children because of uh, they're not getting well vaccinated. So we, in summary, to finish, we explain the disease severity of COVID-19 and MESC, what are the clinical uh, course or disease process or pathogenesis that children manifest different than adults. The risk factors that we have uh, discovered in pediatrics that are still for getting a patient on the ICU, that the clinical course is uh, better in children. They survive more because of the, depending on the comorbidities and how uh, the evolution of the critical care management uh, has uh, went from uh, doing some things at the beginning of the pandemic and now we, uh, the, it's more support care than anything else and in a focus to prevention. And again, reflect about how uh, prevention strategies can keep us uh, safer. Uh, that will be all. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ricardo, for this uh, nice lecture. It's very evidence-based and uh, comprehensive. Uh, and this actually uh, set me relieved, actually, for my kids, you know, there is um, uh, much worries about uh, pediatric population, not only as physicians, but as parents as well. So if uh, Ricardo Grazia is a politician in the Puerto Rican government, okay, what will be your decision for the schools? Continue, go ahead, or lock down till every uh, child is uh, vaccinated, or what will be your decision? Well, our experience, like uh, Gloria was saying, uh, Puerto Rico, they uh, abandoned the lockdowns and our mother did some restriction. When finally the schools opened last uh, August, September, we did, did, do not uh, saw an increase of pediatric cases. There were more uh, um, asymptomatic cases, like uh, somebody in the room or the classroom had a call, they did the test, they found that the test was positive and they will get isolated, they will not go to school, but the schools did not got closed. Uh, we got a very good response. The, in Puerto Rico, when you, when you come, you will see everybody is using the mask outdoors or and indoors. The people got very used to the masking, so there, there's not so much resistance for using the mask. And in the case of pediatrics, when the vaccination began uh, above 11 years old, uh, there was a good response. We, we already have more than 70% of those patients, uh, adolescents that are immunized. And the group that is between 5 to 11, uh, it is estimated in 200,000 200, uh, children. And uh, the Department of Health uh, has a good rate of response from people getting them to get the immunization. Uh, a lot of resistance, there is always some groups, but again, uh, the, uh, we as a country has proven that the child, children has not caused close of schools or uh, um, a lot of clusters of cases. The adults are still causing the clusters. Usually can, you can trace them to small parties or activities where everybody got uh, indoor and had uh, low distances or they were not uh, immunized. Thanks. So, um, uh, just there was a question about the vaccination for children, but uh, I think we already have been through this, uh, through the recommendations and the lecture. Uh, yeah. Again, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Just, just a, a quick detail on the uh, vaccine of the, from Pfizer from five to the lower dose. It is important that you get the appropriate uh, dose, uh, meaning usually the dose is like a third from the dose that we got as, adult, as an adults, but it's not that you should get uh, one third of the dose that it will put on us and put in on the child because the, the vaccine has been refer, uh, reconfigured in the sense that uh, one of the media that has the vaccine, change to less reaction. So the, there were other changes made, not only to the uh, uh, mRNA molecule, it's not in the, in, the, in the media that the vaccine is prepared. It lasts longer, shelf life. So it, it lasts longer to can immunize more people. So again, that in, in, your, in the desperation of getting everybody immunized, don't start using the dose of the adults in the children. You have to get the vial that get, is for that patient. A range. Thank you very much. Um, appreciating answering questions. Um, uh, at the end, we uh, we have to thank you again, uh, Dr. Gloria and Dr. Ricardo, for the the nice presentations and the comprehensive review of the COVID situation with adults and pediatrics. And um, thank you, everyone attended this uh, uh, webinar. We have a hundred, uh, more than hundred participants tonight. Uh, thanks again, and uh, and uh, back to you, Dr. Saad. Uh, have a nice evening, everybody from Dublin. Uh, Omar was speaking to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Omar, and thank you very much for our top speakers from Puerto Rico, uh, Glory and Ricardo. So uh, for honoring us uh, tonight uh, for this. Actually, that's the hot topic for this, the hot time now. 
because you know that uh, the mutation of the virus is coming and uh, the chosen uh, topics are extremely uh, appropriate for this uh, uh, hot time now. Uh, all my colleagues attending the webinar, as the former said, that uh, more than 100 uh, colleagues and all respectable. Uh, thank you so much uh, for um, here from Ireland, from Egypt, from India, from everywhere. And uh, to our top speakers tonight from Puerto Rico, uh, uh, Glory and Ricardo. Thank you so much.